Did you know Dragapult is based on the fossil Diplocolus? And the reason it has a ghostly tail is because we've yet to find a Diplocolus fossil with a complete tail. Did you know that the Pokemon Relicanth is based on a living fossil Coelacanth? And did you know that Stone Jana is based on Stonehenge? Oh wait, that one's kind of obvious. Hold on. The legendaries from Pokemon Scarlet and Violet Teal Mask are actually based on the Japanese folk tale Momotaro, which means Peach Boy. This is a very quick summary of the story. An elderly couple found a large peach float by in the river. They took the peach home and tried to cut the peach open. A boy emerged from the peach and they raised a the kid for many years. One day, Momotaro hears about the evil ogres that were doing bad things to the villagers. Momotaro decided he wanted to venture out to Ogre Island to take back the treasures they stole. But before he left, the elderly couple left him some special food to give him strength. On his journey, he met a dog, a monkey, and a pheasant on his quest to find ogres. Once they reached their destination, they used their powers to barge onto Ogre Island and defeat the ogres. The ogres bowed down and promised never to do wicked things again. They gave back Momotaro all the treasures they stole from the villagers. The elderly couple was happy to see the sun return safely, and they all lived happily ever after. So how does this relate to the inspirations behind the loyal three Pokemon? Well, they just reversed the roles. They made it the other way round. In the original story, the boy and the peach and the three animals are supposed to be the good guys, and the ogre is the villain. With some creative artistic liberties, Pokemon reverse the roles so that the boy and the peach and his goons are the bad ones, and the ogre is the victim. In the untold story of Pitcherunt, the events play out quite similarly to the original tale. Pitcherunt recruits the dog Okie Dogie, the monkey Monkey Dory, and the pheasant Pheasantipity. Together, they assembled their team of friends and travelled across the lands, the mountains, and the oceans in search of the ogre's treasures. With planned strategical cunning, they used their teamwork to steal three of the ogre's masks. Alas, the ogre was not happy, and promptly beat them all up. You have to wonder, how do four poison types lose against a grass type? They have the type advantage and the advantage in numbers. In the end, Pecherant and his companions do not emerge victorious. In a way, neither side wins. Pecherant has flashbacks of happier days, and Ogapon loses her trainer, spending some time feeling lonely. When you send out Ogapon against Pecherant in the epilogue of the Pokemon Scarlet Violet DLC, Ogapon will make an angry response. When you send a member from the Loyal 3 against Pecherant, Pecherant will get angry, almost as if it feels betrayed. Knowing that the tale of Momotaro is a direct inspiration behind these legendaries, it's not really something addressed in game. The closest you get is Carmine mentioning that they might be connected. But this design inspiration was something that I learned from sources outside the game online. I wouldn't have known if it wasn't for the online Pokemon communities. Hi, I'm Dona on YouTube, and this is my new experimental project called Origin of Species Pokemon Design Inspiration, where we investigate the origins and inspirations behind the design of Pokemon species. The reason why I want to make this series is because, well, I love Pokemon. The Pokemon, the creatures themselves, are the lifeblood of this franchise. I want to know the direct inspirations behind the Pokemon creatures. I don't really care about speculation and fan theories, I just want the cold hard facts. I wish the people at Game Freak would just release a book or a resource detailing the exact inspirations and thoughts they had while they were designing all a thousand plus Pokemon. If they could credit the artist or people involved with designing each specific Pokemon, that'd be good too. Someone designed the Pokemon, it didn't just come out of nowhere. I wish they'd be completely transparent about it. Even just for preservation purposes, there must be so much insider knowledge about the Pokemon that could be lost to time. So that's why I want to make this video. 
I graduated with first class honours in biology and environmental science. That's my qualifications. I have a science background, but a good number of Pokemon inspirations are not rooted in science. They're based on folklore and fiction. There are dangers in using scientific methods to explain Pokemon evolution because it can do more harm than good. So all I'm going to do is point out the most likely inspirations behind a Pokemon design without going into far-fetched territory. So here are two Pokemon based on carnivorous plants, which are plants that eat animals. Victory Bell strongly resembles a pitcher plant and Carnivine clearly resembles a Venus flytrap with the jagged leafy mouth. So Bronzol and Bronzong are supposed to be based on an old Japanese myth that is best known as Ophimura and a bell. In this story, there's these priests or monks that wanted to forge a bell for their temple, so they asked a local woman to donate their bronze mirrors for this purpose. One woman contributed her mirror, but later regretted it. Her mirror was the only one that didn't melt, and out of shame she took her own life. But before she did, she stated that whoever could break the bronze bell would be given great wealth by her ghost. A multitude of people tried to break the bell by ringing it furiously, but the monks rolled the bell into the forest and into a swamp out of frustration. So if you ever fight a Bronzong and think, why is this Pokemon so tank? Well, it's probably because no one successfully broke the bell. According to Bulbapedia, the exact inspiration for Combi was a request to create a Pokemon made of three honeycombs stuck together. Algium and Behium are apparently based off alien stereotypes. Algium stands for Little Green Men and Behem stands for Bug-Eyed Monster. I'm still waiting on a third evolution called A. Lamau. I found this graphic from an Algium and Behem enthusiast on Reddit and I tried to decipher it. Algium evolves at level 42 because that's like the number given as the answer for life or something. We need to raid Area 51 because it's infamous for its UFO and alien sightings there. It's big brain time because of their advanced intellect. You know, I might just leave this one for the Algium and Behem fans to explain. Cranidos and Rampados are based on a Pachycephalosaurus, a thick-headed lizard. Their most prominent feature is their thick domed skull. Helioptile and Heliosk seem to be based on the frilled neck lizards. There are some elements of using solar power to photosynthesize sunlight in their design. The distinctive frills help frilled neck lizards scare off predators and communicate between individuals. Eurantus is one of my favorite Alola Pokemon. Never mind that I have a lot of favorite Pokemon, which kind of defeats the purpose of the word favorite. Eurantus is genius design because it's based on an orchid mantis, a mantis that tries to mimic the appearance of a flower to help them hunt and camouflage. They inverted this concept and thought, okay, let's have an orchid plant mimic the appearance of a mantis, so it looks like a bug type, but it is in fact pure grass type. It kind of looks like it's wearing a kimono as well. Bramblem and Bramblegrass are straight up based on tumbleweeds. These are a certain kind of plant that use wind as its primary mode of seed disposal, once they have matured, dried and detached from the plant's root system. The ghost typing might be because of the association of tumbleweeds with ghost towns and empty deserts. Tumbleweeds thrive in areas of disturbed soil, like arid rangelands with sparse vegetation. They're considered invasive species in some areas. In order to evolve Bramblem, you have to make the Pokemon walk a thousand steps in Let's Go mode and level up. Even the movement, even the way it rolls is reminiscent of tumbleweeds. Rilla is roller backwards. It's based on a dung beetle, which is a subcategory of the Scarab family. I feel like this image is missing something. Ah yes, it's missing a fedora, now it's perfect. The evolution of Rilla, Rabska, is an anagram of Scarab. There seems to be some Egyptian motifs on reincarnation, since Rabska is supposedly no longer the main body, but instead is a toad-like infant inside the ball it carries. It could be an endless cycle of being a tiny grub being carried by its old body before it matures into an adult beetle that collects nutrients to reincarnate again. When researching to make this video, there wasn't many primary sources, like actual developer commentary on the Pokemon designs, and a lot of the resources you see online, you have to take off a grain of salt. I looked through the trivia section for Pokemon and Bulbapedia, and I'll give you some context to start with, but it's not enough. It's actually really hard to find definitive sources on Pokemon Origins. Like, a lot of these inspirations are plausible and perhaps likely, but I just couldn't find hard evidence. And then I found Dr. Lava Cut content. 
I went through the Generation 5 Historia archives and thought, this is exactly what I'm looking for. So credits to Dr. Lava Cut content for digging up a lot of hard evidence for Pokemon inspirations. It was like the only legit source I could find. Volcarona, the sun Pokemon, is a strong bug fire Pokemon that would appear in ruins. It was originally going to have four wings, but they added two more wings to make it look significantly more powerful. The spots on the wings are supposed to resemble sunspots. Sunspots are temporary areas that are darker and cooler than the surrounding areas due to fluctuations in temperature on the surface of the sun. There's also some design references to the Tower of the Sun. Darmanitan and Darumaka are based off Daruma dolls. The concept of a fire-type gorilla Pokemon resembling a Daruma doll was born when the artist burned a Daruma doll resembling a gorilla at the festival. It's a Japanese tradition where you buy the doll, and at first the figure's eyes are both blank white. You colour in one eye and make a goal or a New Year's resolution, and when you achieve that goal, you fill in the other eye. As part of the Dharma Kuyo ceremony, the Dharma doll is returned to the temple from which it was brought and burned. And that's all the picks for this video. If you like Pokemon, you can subscribe. If you're already subscribed, thank you. I hope this video is informative. Comment your favorite Pokemon design inspiration or any Pokemon origin that I missed. And for those that have watched this far, I'd like to end this video by leaving some final thoughts. I'm including this because I thought it was insightful. This is from an interview with Kentaro Miura, the author of the manga Berserk. For context, he was talking about how he tried to portray magic in his work by going back to the original source of the idea. He said, If you want to make a movie that rivals Star Wars, you can't watch Star Wars. Go watch what George Lucas was watching for the purpose of making Star Wars. Follow what's already been depicted, and you might just end up with an inferior copy. There's a long history of folk tales, and they're awfully public things, aren't they? On the other hand, anime and light novels that chase after constantly shifting fans? I couldn't tell you what they're going to leave behind to history. If you want your work to stick around for a long time, I'd like to encourage you to look closely into old things. Go back to the originator, and there comes into view the original shape that's totally different from the current image. Thank you for watching Project Origin of Species Pokemon Design Inspirations. <laughs>